hardly a secret that the terms of political discourse are not exactly models of precision. And considering the way terms are used, it's next to impossible to uh, try to give a meaningful answer to such questions as uh, what is socialism or what is capitalism or what are markets, free markets, and uh, many others in common usage. And that's even more true of the term uh, anarchism for reasons that uh, Nathan pointed out. It's been not only subject to ver very varied use, but also uh, a quite extreme abuse, uh, sometimes by bitter enemies, sometimes, unfortunately, by people who hold its manner high. So much so, so much is the variation and abuse that it uh, resists any simple characterization. In fact, the only way I can see to address the question that's posed this evening, what is anarchism, is to try to identify some leading ideas that animate at least major currents of the rich and uh, complex and often contradictory traditions of anarchist thought and uh, crucially anarchist action. Well, I think a sensible approach can start with uh, remarks by uh, the perceptive important anarchist intellectual act and also activist uh, Rudolf Rocker. I'll quote him. He saw anarchism not as a fixed self-enclosed social system with a fixed answer to all the multifarious questions and problems of human life, but rather as a definite trend in the historic development of mankind, which strives for the free, unhindered unfolding of all the individual and social forces in life. It's from the 1930s. Uh, these uh, concepts are, are not really original. They derive from the Enlightenment and the early Romantic period uh, in rather similar words. Uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt, one of the founders of classical liberalism, among many other achievements, described the leading principle of his thought as the absolute and essential importance of human development in its richest diversity. That's a phrase that John Stuart Mill took as the epigraph to his On Liberty. It follows from that that institutions that constrain such human development are illegitimate, unless, of course, they can somehow justify themselves. Uh, you find a similar conception widely in Enlightenment thought. So, for example, in Adam Smith, uh, everyone has read the opening paragraphs of Wealth of Nations where he extols uh, the wonders of division of labor, but not many people have gotten farther inside to read his bitter condemnation of division of labor and his insistence that in any civilized society the government will have to intervene to prevent it because it will destroy personal integrity and essential human rights will turn people, he said, into creatures as stupid and ignorant as a human can be. It's not too easy to find that passage. Uh, whatever the reason may be, if you look in the uh, scholar, standard scholarly edition, the University of Chicago by uh, bicentennial edition, it's not even listed in the index. Well, but it's one of the most important passages in the book. Uh, uh, looked at uh, in these terms, Anarchism is a tendency in human development that seeks to identify structures of hierarchy, domination, authority, uh, and uh, others that constrain human development. And then it seeks to subject them to a very reasonable uh, challenge. Justify yourself. Demonstrate that you're legitimate. And maybe in some special circumstances or conceivably in principle. Uh, and if you can't meet that, uh, that challenge, which is the usual case, the structure should be dismantled. And as Nathan rightly adds, not just dismantled, but reconstructed from below. Uh, the ideals that found expression during the Enlightenment and the Romantic era, uh, they foundered on the shoals of rising industrial capitalism.
which is completely antithetical to them. But uh, Rocker argues, I think quite plausibly, that they remain alive in the libertarian socialist traditions. These range pretty widely. They range from uh, left anti-Bolshevik Marxism, that people like uh, Anton Panikok, uh, Karl Korsch, Paul Maddock, and others, including the anarcho-syndicalism that uh, reached its peak of achievement in the uh, revolutionary period in Spain in 1936. And it's well to remember that despite its uh, substantial achievements and successes, it was crushed by the combined force of fascism, communism, and Western democracy. They had differences, but they agreed that this had to be crushed. The effort of free people to control their own lives, that had to be crushed before they turned to their uh, petty differences, which are, we call the Spanish Civil War. Uh, the uh, same... Uh, the same tendencies reach further to uh, worker-controlled enterprises. Uh, they're springing up in large parts of the old Rust Belt in the United States, in northern Mexico. They've reached their uh, greatest development in the Basque country in, in Spain. Uh, Mondragon is partly a reflection of the achievements of the long complex and uh, rich Spanish tradition of anarchism. And partly it comes out of Christian anarchist sources. Uh, there's also uh, included in this general tendency are the uh, quite substantial and uh, uh, cooperative movements that, are, uh, uh, that exist in many parts of the world. And I think it also encompasses at least a good part of uh, feminist and human rights activism. Well, in part, all of this sounds like truism. So why should anyone defend illegitimate structures? No, no reason, of course. And I think that perception is correct. It really is truism. I think anarchism is basically ought to be called truism. Uh, but truisms have some merit. Uh, one of them is the merit of being true, uh, unlike uh, most political discourse. And this particular truism belongs to an interesting category of principles, uh, principles that are not only universal, but doubly universal. They're universal in that they're almost universally accepted and universal in that they're almost universally rejected in practice. And this is one of, there are many of these. Uh, for example, the uh, general principle that we should apply to ourselves the same standards we do to others, if not harsher ones. A few would object, a few would practice it or uh, more specific uh, policy proposals like uh, democracy promotion or uh, a humanitarian intervention, uh, professed, generally rejected in practice almost universally, all doubly universal. And uh, this truism is the same, the truism that we should uh, challenge and uh, uh, coercive institutions of all kinds demand that they justify themselves, dismantle and reconstruct them if they do not. Easy to say, but not so easy to act on in practice. Uh, well, proceeding with similar thoughts, I'll quote Rock, Rocker again, anarchism seeks to free labor from economic exploitation and to free society from ecclesiastical or political guardianship. And by doing that, opening the way to an alliance of free groups of men and women based on cooperative labor and a planned administration of things in the interest of the community. Now, Rocker was an anarchist activist as well as political thinker, and he goes on to call on the uh, workers' uh, organizations, other popular organizations, to create, I'm quoting, not only the ideas, but also the facts of the future itself within the current society. That's an injunction that goes back to Bakunin. Uh, one traditional anarchist slogan is uh, ni Dieu ni maître, no God, no master. It's a phrase that uh, Daniel Guérin took as the title of his very valuable collection of anarchist classics. Uh, I think it's fair to understand the phrase no God in 
the terms that I just quoted from Rocker, opposition to ecclesiastical guardianship. Uh, individual beliefs are a different matter. That's no matter of concern to a person concerned with free development of thought and action. And that leaves the door open to uh, the lively and impressive uh, tradition of uh, religious anarchism. For example, uh, Dorothy Day's uh, uh, very impressive Catholic workers movement. But the phrase no master is different. Uh, that refers not to individual belief, but to a social relation a relation of subordination and dominance, a relation that anarchism, if taken seriously, seeks to dismantle and rebuild from below, unless it can somehow meet the harsh burden of establishing its legitimacy. Well, by now, we've departed from truism, uh, in fact, to ample controversy. Uh, in particular, right at this point, the rather peculiar American brand of what's called libertarianism that departs very sharply from the libertarian tradition. It accepts and indeed strongly advocates the subordination of working people to the masters of the economy and furthermore the subjection of everyone to the restrictive discipline and uh, destructive features of markets. Now, these are topics worth pursuing. I'll Take them up later if you'd like, but I'll put them aside here. Although also recommending to you uh, Nathan's comment, his suggestion about bringing together in some way the energies of uh, the young uh, libertarian left and right, as is indeed sometimes done. Uh, for example, it's done in the quite important work of uh, valuable theoretical and practical work of uh, economist David Ellerman and some others. Well, well uh, anarchism, anarchism, of course, is famously opposed to the state, while at the same time advocating planned administration of things in the interests of the community, Rocker's phrase again. And beyond that, uh, broader federations of uh, uh, self-governing communities, uh, workplaces. Well, in the real world of today, the same dedicated anarchists who are opposed to the state uh, often support state power to protect people and society and the earth itself from the ravages of concentrated private capital. So take, say, a venerable anarchist journal like uh, Freedom. Uh, goes back to 1886, formed as a journal of socialist anarchism by uh, by uh, supporters of, um, of, of Kropotkin. Uh, if you open its pages, you'll find that much of it is devoted to defending uh, uh, rights of people, the environment, uh, society, often by invoking state power, uh, like regulation of uh, uh, the environment or safety and health uh, regulations in uh, the workplace. Uh, There's no uh, contradiction here, as sometimes thought. Uh, people live and suffer and endure in this world, and not some world that we imagine. And all the means available should be used uh, to safeguard and uh, benefit them, even if the long-term goal is to displace these devices and construct preferable alternatives. Uh, in discussing this, I've sometimes used an image that comes from the uh, Brazilian workers' movement. It's discussed in interesting work by Bjorn Mayberry Lewis. Uh, they speak of, uh, with the, they use the image of widening the, the floors of the cage. The cage is existing coercive institutions that can be widened by uh, committed uh, popular struggle happened effectively over many years. And you can extend the image beyond. Uh, think of the cage uh, of coercive state institutions as a kind of protection from uh, savage beasts that are roaming outside, namely the predatory state-supported capitalist institutions that are dedicated to the principle of private gain, power, domination, uh, with the interest of the community at most a footnote, maybe revered in rhetoric, uh, 
but dismissed in practice and in fact uh, even in uh, Anglo-American law. Uh, well, it's worth also worth remembering that uh, anarchists condemned really existing states, not visions of unrealized democratic dreams, uh, such as government of, by, and for the people. Uh, they bitterly opposed the uh, rule of what Bakunin had called the red bureaucracy, which he predicted 50 years in advance would be among the most savage of human creations. And they also opposed uh, parliamentary systems that are instruments of class rule. Uh, the contemporary United States, for example, uh, which is uh, not a democracy, it's a plutocracy. Uh, it's very easy to demonstrate. The majority of the population has no influence over policy. And as you move up the income wealth scale, uh, you get more and more influence. The very top people get what they want well established by academic uh, political science, but uh, familiar to everyone who uh, looks at the way the world works. Uh, a truly democratic system would be quite different. It would have the character of, quote again, an alliance of free groups of men and women based on cooperative labor and a planned administration of things in the interests of the community. In fact, that's not too remote from one version of the mainstream democratic ideal. Actually, one version, I stress that, I'll return to others. So take, for example, the leading American social philosopher of the 20th century, uh, John Dewey. His major concerns were democracy and education. Uh, no one took Dewey to be an anarchist, but pay attention to his ideas. Uh, in his conception of democracy, illegitimate structures of coercion must be dismantled. And that includes, I'll quote him, domination by business for private profit through private control of banking, land, industry, reinforced by command of the press, press agents, other means of publicity and propaganda. Uh, he recognized, still quoting, that power today resides in control of the means of production, exchange, publicity, transportation, and communication. Whoever owns them rules the life of the country, even if democratic forms remain. And until these institutions are in the hands of the public, politics will remain the shadow cast, on big, uh, uh, cast by big business on society, uh, very much what we see around us, in fact. Uh, but it's important that Dewey went beyond calling for some form of public control. That could take many forms. Uh, he went beyond. In a free and democratic society, he wrote, uh, workers should be the masters of their own industrial fate, not tools rented by employers not directed by state authorities. Now that position goes right back to the leading ideas of classical liberalism articulated by von Humboldt, Smith, others, and extended in the anarchist tradition. Uh, turning to education, Dewey held that it is illiberal and immoral to train children to work not freely and intelligently, but for the sake of the work earned to achieve test scores, for example, in which case their activity is not free because it's not freely participated in and it's quickly forgotten too, as all of us know from our experience. So he proceeded to conclude that industry must be changed from a feudalistic to a democratic social order and educational practice should be designed to encourage creativity, exploration, independence, cooperative work. Exactly the opposite of what's happening today. Well, these ideas lead to a vision of society based on workers' control of productive institutions, linked to community control, within the framework of free association and federal organization. In the general style of thought that includes of course, along with many anarchists, uh, others too, say G.D.H. Cole's uh, Guild Socialism, England, left uh, anti-Bolshevik Marxism, 
uh, current developments, such as, for example, the uh, participatory economics and politics of Michael Albert, Robin Hannell, Stephen Shalom, and others, along with important work in theory and practice by the late Seymour Melman, his associates, and uh, many others, and uh, uh, notably Gar Alperovitz's very valuable recent contributions on worker-owned enterprise and cooperatives, not just talk, but uh, actual taking place. Well, going back to Dewey, uh, he was uh, as American as apple pie, to borrow the old cliché, right in the mainstream of American history and culture. And in fact, all of these ideas and developments are very deeply rooted in the American tradition and in American history, a fact which is kind of suppressed but is very, very obvious when you look into it. And when you pursue these uh, questions, you enter into an important terrain of uh, inspiring, often bitter struggle. That's ever since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, which was right around here. Lowell, Lawrence, Eastern Massachusetts, mid-19th century. Uh, the first serious scholarly work, uh, study of the uh, industrial worker in those years, it was 90 years ago, it's by Norman Ware, still very much worth reading. Uh, he reviews uh, the hideous working conditions that were imposed on formerly independent craftsmen and immigrants and farmers, as well as uh, the so-called factory girls, young women brought from the farms to work in the textile mills around Boston. He mentions that, he reviews it, but he focuses attention on something else, on what he calls the degradation suffered by the industrial worker, the loss of status and independence, which could not be canceled. Uh, even where there occasionally was some material improvement. And he focuses on the radical capitalist social revolution in which sovereignty and economic affairs passed from the community as a whole into the keeping of a special class of masters, uh, often remote from production, a group alien to the producers. And Ware shows, I think pretty convincingly, that for every protest against machine industry, and privation, uh, there can be found a hundred protests against the new power of capitalist production and its discipline. In other words, workers were struggling and striking not just for bread but for roses in the traditional slogan of the workers' communities and organizations. Uh, they were struggling for dignity and independence, uh, for their rights as free men and women. And their journals are very interesting. There's a rich and lively labor press written by working people, artisans from Boston, factory girls from the farms. Uh, in these journals, they condemned what they called the blasting influence of monarchical principles on democratic soil, which will not be overcome until they who work in the mills will own them, the slogan of the massive Knights of Labor and sovereignty will return to free and independent producers. Then they will no longer be menials or the humble subjects of a foreign despot, the absentee owner, slaves in the strictest sense of the word who toil for their masters. Or rather, they will regain their status as free American citizens. The capitalist revolution uh, instituted a crucial change from price to wage, it's very important. When a producer sold his product for a price, he retained his person. But when he came to sell his labor, he sold himself. I'm quoting from the press, that's a big difference. He lost his dignity as a person as he became a slave, a wage slave, to use the common term of the period. Uh, 160 years ago, a group of skilled workers repeated the common view that a daily wage was equivalent to slavery, and they weren't warned uh, perceptively that a day might come when wage slaves will so far forget what is due to manhood as to glory in a system forced on them by their necessity and in opposition to their feelings of independence and self-respect 
a day that they hoped would be far distant. Uh, these were very popular notions in the mid-19th century. In fact, so popular that they were a slogan of the Republican Party. Uh, you could read them in editorials of the New York Times. That's then, not now, but that day may come back, let's hope. Uh, labor activists at the time warned bitterly often of what they called the new spirit of the age, gain wealth forgetting all but self. That was a new spirit of the age 150 years ago. And in sharp reaction to this demeaning spirit, uh, there were quite enormous uh, and active uh, rising movements of uh, working people and radical farmers. Uh, radical farmers actually began in Texas, uh, spread through the Midwest and much of the country. It was, of course, an agricultural country then. Now, these are the most significant democratic popular movements in American history. They were uh, dedicated to solidarity, mutual aid, uh, it's a battle. They were crushed by force. We have a very violent labor history as compared to other countries. Uh, but it's a battle that's not over, far from over, uh, despite setbacks, often violent repression. Uh, well, there are apologists, uh, familiar apologists, for the radical revolution of wage slavery. And they have an argument. They argue that the worker should indeed glory in a system of free, cr free contracts voluntarily undertaken. Uh, there was an answer to that 200 years ago by Shelley in a, his great poem, Mask of Anarchy. This was written right after the Peterloo Massacre in England, Manchester, when British cavalry uh, brutally attacked a peaceful gathering of tens of thousands of people, the first major example of huge nonviolent protest and the reaction of the state authorities to it. They were calling for parliamentary reform. So Shelley wrote that we know what slavery is, tis to work and have such pay as just keeps life from day to day in your limbs as in a cell for the tyrants used to dwell. Tis to be slave in soul and to hold no strong control over your own wills but be all that others make of ye. That's slavery. That's what working people and independent farmers were struggling against. And the artisans and factory girls who struggled for dignity and independence and freedom might very well have known Shelley's words. Uh, observers at the time noted that they were highly literate. They had good libraries. They were acquainted with the uh, standard works of uh, English literature. Uh, before, this is before mechanism and uh, wage slavery, the wage system uh, ended the days of, at least curtailed the days of independence, uh, high culture and security. Uh, before that, uh, where points out a workshop might be what he called a lyceum. A journeyman would uh, hire boys to read to them while they worked. These were social businesses uh, with many opportunities for reading, discussion, mutual improvement. Uh, along with the factory girls, the journeymen, the artisans, uh, bitterly condemned uh, the attack on their culture. Uh, the same was true in England, incidentally, where conditions were much harsher. There's actually a great book about this by Jonathan Rose called The Intellectual Life of the British Working Class. It's a monumental study of the reading habits of the working class of what we think of as Dickensian England. And he contrasts what he calls the passionate pursuit of knowledge by proletarian autodidacts with the pervasive Philistinism of the British aristocracy. Actually, I'm old enough to remember uh, residues that remained among working people uh, right here in New York in the 1930s who were deeply immersed in the high culture of the day. It's another battle that may have receded, but I don't think it's lost. Well, I mentioned that uh, Dewey and American workers and farmers held one version of democracy with very strong libertarian elements. Uh, but the dominant version has been 
radically different. Its most instructive expression is at the progressive end of the spectrum, mainstream spectrum. So uh, that is pe among people who are good uh, Woodrow Wilson, FDR, Kennedy liberals. Uh, here's a few representative quotes from uh, icons of the liberal intellectual establishment on democratic theory. Uh, the public are ignorant and meddlesome outsiders. Uh, they have to be put in their place. Decisions must be in the hands of an intelligent minority of responsible men, namely us. And we have to be protected from the trampling and roar of the bewildered herd out there. Uh, the herd does have a function in a democratic society. Uh, they're supposed to lend their weight every few years to a choice among the responsible men. Now, but apart from that, their function is to be spectators, not participants in action. And all of this is for their own good. Uh, we should not succumb to democratic dogmatisms about men being the best judges of their own interests. They're not. They're like young children. You have to take care of them. We're the best judges of their own interests. So their attitudes and opinions have to be controlled for their own benefit. Uh, we have to regiment their minds the way an army regiments bodies. And we have to discipline the institutions responsible for what they called the indoctrination of the young, uh, schools, universities, churches. Uh, if we can do this, we can get back to the good old days. This is complaints about the 60s. We can get back to the good old days when Truman had been able to govern the country with the cooperation of a relatively small number of Wall Street lawyers and bankers, and then we'll have true democracy. Now, these are quotes from uh, icons of the liberal establishment. Uh, Walter Lippmann, Edward Bernays, Harold Laswell, founder of modern political science, Samuel Huntington, Trilateral Commission, uh, which largely staffed the Carter administration. Well, the conflict between these conceptions of democracy goes far back, goes back to the earliest modern democratic revolution in uh, 17th century England. At that time, as you know, a war, there was a war raging between supporters of the king and supporters of parliament. That's the civil war that we read about. But there was more. Uh, the gentry, the men who called themselves the men of best quality, uh, they were appalled by the rabble who didn't want to be ruled by either king or parliament, uh, like the Spanish workers in 1936, neither side. Uh, they wanted to be ruled as they, put, they had their own pamphlet, pamphlet literature, and they said they wanted to be ruled by countrymen like ourselves that know our wants. Uh, it will never be a good world while knights and gentlemen make us laws that are chosen for fear and do but oppress us and do not know the people's sores. That's 17th century England. Uh, the essential nature of this conflict, which is far from ended, was captured uh, nicely by Thomas Jefferson in his later years when uh, he had serious concerns about both the quality and the fate of the democratic experiment. He made a distinction between what he called aristocrats and democrats. Now, the aristocrats, I'm quoting him, are those who fear and distrust the people and wish to draw all powers from them into the hands of the higher classes. Now, the democrats, in contrast, identify with the people, have confidence in them, cherish and consider them as the honest and safe, although not the most wise, depository of the public interest. The modern progressive intellectuals, the Wilson, Roosevelt, Kennedy intellectual left, uh, those who seek to put the public in the, their place and are free from democratic dogmatisms about the capacity of the ignorant and meddlesome outsiders to enter the political arena, they're Jefferson's aristocrats. Uh, these basic views are very widely held, though there are some disputes, uh, namely who should play the guiding role. Should it be what the liberal intellectuals call the technocratic and policy-oriented intellectuals, uh, 
uh, the ones we celebrate as the Camelot intellectuals uh, who uh, uh, run the uh, progressive knowledge society, or should it be bankers or corporate executives, in other versions, should it be the Central Committee or the uh, Guardian Council of Clerics, all pretty similar ideas. And they're all examples of the uh, ecclesiastical and political guardianship that the genuine libertarian tradition seeks to dismantle and reconstruct from below, while also changing industry from a feudalistic to a democratic social order, one that's based on workers' control, community control, respects the dignity of the producer as a genuine person, not a tool in the hands of others, in accordance with a libertarian tradition that has deep roots and like uh, Marx's old mole, is always burrowing quite close to the surface and ready to spring forth. Thanks. So uh, for the discussion, I'd like to invite anybody who has a question to um, to line up behind the microphones on either side, um, and please try to try to keep it uh, concise. And as you do that, I'd like to start, if you don't mind. I just wonder if you could say something about the images that represent some of your first encounters with anarchism. I mean, I think for people who have gotten excited about these ideas through the Occupy movement, it was important to see it in practice somehow. I wonder what those images have been for you. Well, I grew up in the 1930s, that's when I was a kid, it was a deep depression and uh, uh, plenty of suffering. And there were images that, that, that kind of stick in my mind, uh, you know, people coming to, the, my parents were teachers, so we had some money, you know, not rich, but got along. And in fact, the whole family of uh, unemployed working class kind of converged around, uh, around uh, our house. We had at least something. Uh, but there were images of people uh, coming to the door, uh, uh, trying to sell rags, to try to get a piece of bread to survive. Uh, uh, I remember riding with my mother on trolley cars, uh, uh, watching, going past textile plants, this is Philadelphia, and watching uh, women on strike being brutally beaten by security forces. Uh, I, my own family was, extended family, was mostly unemployed working class. And as I mentioned, very high culture. As the New Deal sort of began to have an impact, uh, they were able to uh, enjoy Shakespeare plays in the park, uh, go to the Budapest String Quartet, to my unemployed uh, seamstress aunt, who were members of the ILGWU, you know, Ladies' Garment Workers' Union, could get a couple of weeks in the countryside at a solidarity camp. Uh, now that, that was life. A lot of it was Communist Party. We we're not allowed to say anything nice about the Communist Party. That's a rule. And there were a lot of things wrong with it. I've mentioned some of them. Uh, but there were things that were right about it. Like uh, One was that it overcame the amnesia that uh, Nathan talked about. It was always there. You know, People remembered. Somebody remembered how to turn the mimeograph machine or organize a demonstration. And you went from a civil rights demonstration to a labor organizing to something else. They had crazy international ideas, but that, that was kind of in the back of their minds. It wasn't what was really going on. Uh, the destruction of the, the, the Communist Party was quite important. Killed off the radical continuing uh, element that kept a lot of the left traditions going, uh, you know the reasons. It was in the Cold War framework. Uh, that was all there. As far as the anarchists were concerned, the place I learned about that was by reading. I went, when I was a kid, I'd go to visit my relatives, and as soon as I got old enough to get on the train, about 11 or 12 years old, I'd take the train to New York and uh, stay with my relatives, uh, but spend most of my time down on, if those of you who know New York, uh, uh, Union Square used to be the place where the anarchist offices were. 
the Freie Arbeiterstimme, others. And uh, uh, lots of pamphlets, lots of interesting people, very, quite eager to talk to a young kid, you know, so not hard to have discussions. And down below Union Square on 4th Avenue, uh, not today, but then there were rows of small uh, bookstores, a lot of them run by European emigres, many of them Spanish refugees, Spanish anarchist refugees, who were also quite eager to talk and had lots of pamphlets and uh, uh, direct, you know, a real original documentary material. Actually, when I wrote about this 20 years later, I mo used mostly documentary material I had picked up as a young teenager. It wasn't available. A lot of it's available now. It wasn't then. And uh, that was a pretty inspiring picture, I, f I felt. Uh, the Spanish Revolution, at least I felt and feel, was a really inspiring moment, which I think is why it... Uh, elicited such a vicious response from every corner of power. That's quite important to remember. Communists, fascists, liberal democracies, all combined on crushing this. This was something they couldn't tolerate. Then they could have a fight later about who picks up the spoils. Actually, there were uh, anarchist proposals that I felt were not unreasonable. They're disparaged, of course, in the West, but uh, for how to win the Civil War. It was anarchist uh, thinkers like Camilo Berneri, who was murdered by the communists in May 1937, uh, one of the leading anarchist thinkers. He, uh, he proposed that, he, he pointed out, I think, as it turned out quite correctly, that they'd never win a conventional war for one reason, because the commitment to the war on the part of the population had seriously declined after the uh, revolution was crushed. They had lost what they had fought for, and they didn't care very much who was going to pick up the spoils. Uh, he pointed out, and of, uh, and of course, uh, the fascists were being directly supported by, uh, uh, by uh, Hitler and Mussolini, and uh, the West was not opposed to that. Uh, yeah, it's hard, you may forget now, but uh, fascism had a pretty good image in the West in the late 30s. Uh, uh, Mussolini was uh, that admirable Italian gentleman, as Roosevelt called him. Uh, Hitler was regarded by the State Department as, in the late 30s as a moderate who was holding off the forces of left and right, so we shouldn't be too critical of him. Uh, the United States had a consul in Berlin uh, up until Pearl Harbor who was sending back uh, uh, dispatches saying you shouldn't be too hard on the Nazis. They're doing some things we don't like, but uh, they're still kind of moderate. Uh, his name is George Kennan. You don't read that in the biographies. Uh, but that's not untypical of the period. Uh, Roosevelt, for example, Bitter, uh, there was a neutrality act, theoretically. Uh, uh, the, the United States was not supposed to uh, allow uh, support for either side in the Civil War. And Roosevelt was very bitter about any attempt to, by somebody to say, send a pistol to the Republic. Uh, he couldn't stop it by force, but he bitterly condemned it. On the other hand, the State Department couldn't notice what I was reading in the left-wing press at the time, and was later conceded 20 years later, that uh, the United States had authorized the Texco Oil Company, which was run by an outright Nazi, open Nazi, had authorized them to, uh, they, were, they had a contract to ship oil to the Republic, they switched it to shipping oil to the fascist forces, uh, which is the one thing that Hitler and Mussolini couldn't provide. They couldn't find that. The left press could find it, but the State Department couldn't. Uh, well, going back to Berneri, what he proposed was that in Spain itself, uh, the popular forces should fight a guerrilla war. That's an old Spanish tradition. In fact, that's where guerrilla wars in, were initiated under Napoleon. Uh, fight a guerrilla war in Spain itself, and in Morocco, call for support the Moroccan liberation forces that were trying to free themselves from French and British imperial and Spanish imperial control. Uh, that was the base of Franco's army. They were Moorish troops. 
coming from northern Africa. So his idea was fight a revolutionary war and support them in their efforts to overthrow imperialist control that he thought would erode the Spanish, the fascist armies, uh, just as uh, in Spain itself the popular forces were fighting, uh, but uh, until they were crushed. Well, that's, uh, if you read the scholarship on, on the matter up till today, that's kind of dismissed as a sort of a romantic joke. Uh, as the whole anarchist movement is, but I don't think it was. That's worth. Uh, that was my initial exposure. To it. <laughs> Hi, uh, Professor Chomsky. This is an unimaginable honor. Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, I just wanted to. You, you touched briefly. You had this wonderful Shelley quote, and you touched briefly on your family's engagement with high culture. And I was wondering, or I was, I, I was just going to ask you to reflect briefly on the contemporary state of high culture and serious art and how important you think engagement with that, you know, serious contemporary literature, music, cinema, whatever it is, how important it is in exploring the sort of the vanguard of political thought and, uh, you know, whether or not contemporary artists and contemporary audiences are rising to that challenge. Well, I think it's very important and I'm not the only one who thinks so. I think people with power think so. Uh, that's why uh, famous uh, Rivera mural wasn't allowed to be put in uh, Rockefeller Center. And that's why if you go back to cinema, you say go back um, 60 years, uh, early 50s, uh, some of you will remember. Uh, so in 1953, interesting year for cinema, there were two major films that came out, one major, well, two films that came out on uh, the labor movement. One, which was a huge uh, box office success, ton of uh, you know, uh, PR, advertising, and so on, uh, featured Marlon Brando, uh, was about a corrupt union leader and how the heroic, uh, you know, Joe with his lunchbox uh, finally overcame the corrupt union leader and at the end of the film throws him into the water and everybody cheers. So that was one. There was another film, a, low, a marvelous film, called Salt of the Earth, a low-budget film, uh, which was about a, a victorious strike led by a Hispanic woman. It was a really great film. If you can find it somewhere, you should look at it. Uh, no one ever heard of it. You know, I mean, you could find it maybe in a small uh, art theater in downtown New York somewhere. But that wasn't the kind of film that was going to get uh, publicity. And that runs through consistently. And I think uh, when people in power uh, believe something firmly, it's worth paying attention to them. And I think they believe firmly that you should not have a, a revolutionary popular art in which people participate. Actually, that's one of the reasons, I think, for destroying the graffiti in the, uh, the New York subways. That's considered a great achievement of Bloomberg, you know, graffiti, popular art. Uh, all over the subways, you know, because that's just too dangerous. Uh, it's, it's part of the drug war, grotesque drug war, race war, murders. A large part of it came from uh, the fact that uh, the Harlem Renaissance, black artists in Harlem were playing jazz and uh, smoking marijuana. So that had to be destroyed. That became the great criminal of the age. Mexicans were doing it too. Uh, this is... Uh, Pretty constant. So yeah, I think it's uh, that's really important. Um, Noam, what is what is preventing people, if anything, from organizing themselves into worker-controlled cooperatives? You alluded to co-ops, and um, if not much is preventing them from doing so, to what do you attribute their relative lack of popularity? And the related question would be, why? What could um, union-controlled pensions, for example, be doing if the problem is capital, for example? Why aren't more in, in entities like worker control, putatively worker-controlled pensions investing the con capital they have some control over in supporting these kinds of worker-controlled alternatives? Well, first of all, pensions are not in the hands of working people. The unions are not popular democracies. Uh, pensions are in the hands of bureaucrats and money managers, and they're not about to uh, uh, hand over power to uh, 
popular organizations. Actually, to an ex that's not entirely true. There are some interesting initiatives. I don't know if they're going to get anywhere, but they're interesting. Uh, United Steelworkers, which is one of the more progressive unions, uh, has recently uh, made some tentative arrangements with Mondragon in uh, the Basque Country, this huge and worker-owned industrial banking, housing, school, educational cooperative. That could get somewhere. And uh, I mentioned uh, Agar Alperovitz's work. He's uh, discussed very well the, and uh, participates in the spread of uh, worker-owned enterprises in uh, mostly northern Ohio, the old Rust Belt. They have a kind of an interesting history in, uh, which relates very much to this. Back in 1977, at the beginning of the concerted effort to destroy industrial production in the United States and uh, sort of beginning of the kind of neoliberal assault on the population we've been through in the past generation. Uh, U.S. Steel decided to close its main steel plants in Youngstown, Ohio. It was a steel town, like other working class towns like Detroit. It had actually been built by the working classes. It was their town. They didn't get the profit because they're tools, but uh, they built it. They wanted to keep it. Uh, U.S. Steel wanted to sell it to close it down, and the union offered to buy it. Uh, they had community support. They even had some uh, support of, I think it was a Republican governor, just buy, let the workers buy the plant and keep running it. Well, U.S. Steel didn't want that. In fact, this is con pretty consistent. I mentioned Dave Ellerman before. He's one who's written about it and worked on it. Very commonly around here, too, eastern Massachusetts, when workers decide to try to take over an enterprise, maybe, uh, an enterprise which may be perfectly profitable, but not profitable enough for the multinational who, you know, who runs it, maybe they don't want to keep it in their books, when they try to buy it, which would be a good deal for the multinational, they refuse to sell it for class reasons. They have class interests. They do not want to see the spread of uh, popular democratic organizations for perfectly obvious reasons. This just happened in, uh, going back, I'll come back to Youngstown in a minute, but it just happened a couple of years ago right here in Taunton. There was a, a small but quite successful uh, manufacturing plant uh, which made specialized parts for aircraft, doing pretty well. But the multinational didn't want to bother with it, so they were going to close it down. Uh, the union, you know, uh, UE in this case, uh, tried to buy it. The multinationals usually refused to sell it. And there wasn't enough support, popular support, to push it through. If there had been an Occupy movement at that time, real, I think that's something they might have pushed through. Uh, Actually, uh, on a much larger scale, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Obama virtually nationalized the auto industry. Uh, not entirely, but virtually. Uh, there were a couple of options. Uh, one option was to uh, restructure it, uh, use taxpayer funding, uh, hand it back to the original owners or other people just like them, maybe a different face, but you know, bankers, CEOs, and so on, and then have it continue to do what it had been doing before, building cars. That's what they chose. There was another option. Hand it over to the workforce, uh, have them uh, build what's needed in the country, which is not more cars for traffic jams, but high-speed mass transportation. The United States is very backward in the world in this respect. I mean, you can take a high-speed train from Beijing to Kazakhstan, but try to take a train from Boston to New York. It's about as slow as it was 60 years ago. Uh, this, you know, this is really backward. The country needs it. Uh, and the, the former auto industry could have been handed over to the workforce and uh, give, maybe given some support, to probably less than the auto industry got, to do this. But that wasn't an option. Suppose there had been a large-scale Occupy movement, you know, significant. It was significant, but broader, expanded. Well, I think that could have been pushed through. It takes popular consciousness. But going back to Youngstown, uh, the case went to court in 1977. Uh, the un union lost, the workers lost, and it was 
the steel mills were destroyed. Uh, but they didn't give up. They didn't just say, okay, we'll starve to death or go somewhere else. Uh, they began to organize small worker-owned enterprises. And they've been spreading around uh, the Cleveland area, and good Youngstown, good bit of northern Ohio, into other areas. So it is taking place. But, you know, it's, it's happening elsewhere, too. In northern Mexico, there are quite successful worker-owned plants. Uh, it's, it's not easy because, you know, the, 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 the banks don't like to give them capital. And the government doesn't like them and won't support them, again, for class reasons. But if there's sufficient popular support, these things can develop. And it's not easy. You know, it's hard work, and the people who organize usually suffer for it. But that's typical of almost everything. The civil rights movement, uh, the, you know, the, uh, practically any movement that has ever gotten anywhere, the people up front usually take it in the chin, you know. It's hard, and uh, that people have to be willing to endure and for a longer-term gain, and that's not easy. But it can happen, and it does. Hi, I'm just curious if you could <coughs> address um, the role of surveillance technologies and uh, increasingly the militarization of police as far as moving forward in radical thought today and in the future. Kind of what you see that, where that is now. Well, I think there are two things to bear in mind about that. The first thing is that the phenomenon itself shouldn't be at all surprising. The second is that the scale, at least to me, is kind of surprising. I hadn't really expected that scale. But the phenomenon is normal. And it's, again, as American as apple pie. Now, you can go back a century. Uh, uh, take, say, the Philippine War early in the 19th century, uh, 20th century. It was a vicious war. The U.S. conquered the Philippines, killed a couple hundred thousand people. It was a major popular nationalist movement. Uh, after the military victory, it had to be suppressed and controlled. And a huge pacification campaign was initiated using the highest technology of the day for surveillance, uh, uh, subversion, uh, breaking up uh, groups, uh, you know, building up hostilities, uh, all kinds of things. Uh, very sophisticated. It was very quickly transferred home. It was used by Woodrow Wilson in the Red Scare, the worst repression in American history, and developed further since. It's had a lethal effect on the Philippines. Uh, you know, people mourn the typhoon that killed tens of thousands of people. Now, that doesn't happen in functioning societies. It's very striking in the Caribbean. Uh, when a tropical storm goes through the Caribbean, in Haiti, one of the major victims of imperial violence, it's vicious. Uh, right next door in Cuba, three people died. You know, some buildings are knocked over. Same storm. Depends on the society. Well, the Philippines is a society that uh, we created, have maintained. It's the one part of Southeast Asia that hasn't taken part in the so-called Asian miracle, you know, the, uh, not one of the Asian tigers. There's a reason for that, uh, good, uh, good reason. But these techniques, you can be confident that any state or a commercial enterprise, any system of power, is going to use whatever technology is available to try to control and dominate its, um, what amounts to its major enemy, namely the population. Uh, that's what power systems are going to do. Uh, the scale of what was revealed, I think, was a little surprising, but it actually shouldn't be, and there's more to come. Uh, those of you who read technical journals, like, say, the MIT Technology Review, uh, should know what's coming. So, for example, just in the Tech Review recently, there have been articles on uh, th uh, things like uh, there and elsewhere on uh, the hardware and computers, which is now being designed. They blame China, but of course that means it's being done ten times as much here uh, to, to uh, put in uh, components in the hardware that will enable the manufacturer uh, to uh, record every keystroke, everything that's happening on your computer. 
uh, American businesses are worried because if they have Chinese computers, they'll be picking it up at the People's Liberation Army. Uh, but they don't point out that the American systems are doubtless much more advanced than doing the same thing. Uh, robotics is a field that's been worked on pretty hard for many years here too. And one of the goals, quite explicit, nothing secret, is to develop uh, fly-sized drones, tiny robots, which can, you know, get on your on the ceiling of your living room, and carry out constant surveillance. And drones tend to go from surveillance to lethal capacities very quickly, so we can expect that pretty soon. Uh, and uh, these are things that are in development. Any system of power is going to use them. And pretty strikingly, uh, jihadis are going to use them. One of the things we're doing right now is creating perfect technology for terrorist attacks. It's not a secret. You take a look at drone technology. Uh, right by t today already, uh, it's claimed that for uh, $300, you can purchase a small drone online. Now well, that's improving very fast. And for terrorist activities, it's just perfect. Now, if you want to get a picture of it, there's an article in this month's uh, leading journal of uh, foreign affairs in Britain, the Royal Institute Journal of International Affairs, describing how we are uh, rapidly creating the technology uh, to uh, uh, permit uh, massive terrorist attacks on ourselves. That's also typical. Uh, power systems uh, seek short-term power and domination. They are not concerned with security. It's contrary to academic dogma. You can easily show that. They're interested in power, domination, uh, the, uh, the, wel the, uh, the welfare of their primary domestic constituencies, which are wealth, concentrated wealth. And if there's a disaster in the long term, it's not their business. Uh, you can show that I mean, it's obvious with environmental issues. It's the same with nuclear weapons, same right now with drone technology. So sure, this stuff is going to go on unless we stop it. Uh, you can stop it, too. It doesn't have to go on. C can you offer a critique of startup culture and entrepreneurship, which, which offers many of the, characteristics, the seeming characteristics of autonomy but isn't so? seeming characteristics. I mean, startup culture is, you know, it's okay. People like their apps and so on, but <laughs> it, it's based very heavily on state subsidy. It's not, it's kind of a narrow form of entrepreneurship. Now, so take, for example, the Silicon Valley culture. Uh, where, what are they using? Well, they're using computers, uh, the internet, uh, microelectronics, uh, and so on and so forth, almost all developed in the state sector for decades before it's handed over to private power to, uh, uh, for commercialization and uh, application. So yeah, there's initiative there, and uh, people are having fun, and doing maybe interesting things, but relying very heavily on uh, uh, the background state subsidy, which takes many forms. Actually, everyone at MIT ought to know it. It's paid our salaries for years. You know, uh, it's uh, uh, you know for decades, uh, computers and the internet and you know, the whole basis of the IT culture were being developed right here, in similar places in RLE and so on. Uh, and uh, finally, after decades, it was handed over to Bill Gates and Steve Jobs to uh, market and commercialize and make profit and make little things that you carry around with you. Uh, but uh, so it's a, it's a kind of a, it, it has entrepreneurial aspects, but it's a parasitic, but it's parasitic on much more fundamental uh, the development. The really hard work, the hard research and development, the creative work is, is quite substantially in the state sector. And so it's not just subsidy. There are many other devices of uh, taxpayer support for uh, private enterprise. Uh, one of the main ones is procurement. So for example, in the early 60s, after IBM through the 50s had learned mostly in government laboratories and places like this, 
had learned to switch from punch cards to uh, uh, digital computers, and they built the world's biggest computer in the early 60s, stretch computer, fastest computer. But it was much too expensive for business, so the government bought it. That's the purchaser of last resort, and I think it went to Los Alamos. Uh, and that goes on all the time. Procurement's a major form of public subsidy to private enterprise, and there are many other ways. That's one of the reasons why private capital does not want markets. They want markets for other people, but not for themselves. Uh, for themselves, they want a, a nanny state, powerful nanny state that will support them. Uh, what the significance of the entrepreneurial culture is, you can judge. I'm not overwhelmed by the fact that there's thousands of new apps coming every day. I think they're more important things. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, so I had a question about how you reconcile the, the emancipatory tradition of anarchism um, to the kind of abstractness of the ideology itself around authority and, um, and power and coercion. Because it could be argued, for example, that the federal government intervened in the South during the Civil War was coercive to the Confederate States. Um, we, we know that like, it was, uh, uh, the Civil War was a revolution of slaves. Uh, against slavery, um, and the federal government ended up intervening much later. Uh, but that could be argued that was a form of, of authority, um, because I, yeah. So that, how do you how do you actually um, navigate that um, with say, uh, for example, the Marxist kind of definition, which would be um, between labor and capital, for example. Um, do you see that as as something that um, uh, is is maybe different from or offers a sort of a different perspective from anarchism because I think that that could account for the reason why, for example, uh, there are such things as anarcho-capitalism. It can be argued that, you know, several different ways that the, that, that the state is, is intervening on my ability to pay my workers uh, a, a low wage or, or, or whatnot. Um, I'm not sure. I didn't understand exactly. The question of, so my question is authority itself is a really abstract term. Authority of whom, I feel like, is... I don't think is, there's anything abstract about authority. We all live with it all the time. I mean, that's true if you're a, if you're a worker, namely a, a, a wage slave, as workers understood. It's true if you're a, a through the, uh, until very recently, for most women, it's been obvious, nothing abstract about it. Uh, that uh, women didn't uh, women didn't even have legal rights in the United States until pretty recently. Oh, my question is like, if there's, do workers have the authority, for example, to take over a factory? Do they have the authority? Yeah, why not? That's what I mean. I yeah, mean, uh, authority they too. built the plant, they made the product, so they do the work. Uh, why should they be uh, uh, tools rented by some banker somewhere else? I mean, that's the way our institutional structure happens to be if formulated, but doesn't mean it's legitimate. I mean, when you talk about authority, you're asking questions about legitimacy. Do people have the right to run their own lives? Or do they have to be uh, uh, sort of uh, tools in the hands of, far of uh, foreign masters? Well, you know, that's a question of legitimacy, not, not authority. Well, you mentioned the Civil War, and there's uh, ample evidence by now that uh, uh, there was tr very significant slave initiative in the Civil War. Now, there's more to say about that, a lot more. So take the American Revolution. Uh, to a large extent, that was a revolution uh, carried out in order to maintain slavery. You look back at the history in uh, 17, around 1770, the, in Britain, the legal system was beginning to undertake strong condemnations of slavery. There was one famous case, Somerset case, in 1772, where uh, uh, slave owners from the United States brought their slaves with them to England. Uh, one of them escaped. He, there was an effort to, uh, his owner wanted him back, it's my property. And uh, it went to court and went to Lord Mansfield, the famous jurist who uh, ruled that slavery is so odious, that was the term that he used, that it cannot be tolerated on English soil. Uh, crucially, it could be tolerated in the colonies, but that's another story, <laughs> but not on English soil. And the, uh, uh, the United States was, uh, the, the founders of the country were almost all slave owners. Uh, 
and they could see the handwriting on the wall. If the colonies remained under British rule, uh, probably these laws would apply here and they'd lose their property. And uh, that was surely a significant element in the revolution. And it runs right to the present. I mean, right to this moment, the Civil War is still being fought. Uh, simply take a look at the uh, electoral maps, say the map of the election in 2012, red states and blue states. It's almost identical, identical to the Civil War. Uh, it's uh, the Confederacy, which now call themselves Republicans, shifted names, and uh, the rest, which was the North. Uh, a large part of the motivation be behind the effort to shut down the government is just revenge. Uh, we want to shut down Washington and win this war finally. Uh, uh, the United States never developed class parties, like labor parties. They didn't amount to much, but at least they were something. But the U.S. never had them. It's always had sectional parties. And it's a reflection of the Civil War, which has never ended. Uh, it also hasn't ended in the prisons and elsewhere. It's a very deeply rooted thing in the society and hard to extirpate. Yeah. Well, I hope you all join me in thanking uh, Noam Chomsky once more.